thank you very much. And it's a real delight to be here. Um, my brief was to speak about uh, recent advances, uh, advances in future agendas of conflict research and links to development. And that's what I'm going to try to do in 15 minutes. So forgive me if a lot gets missed. This is my personal view on the field. And um, I want to talk about three so main developments which have happened recently. I mean, I'm talking about maybe the last sort of five to 10 years uh, in conflict research. And the first is a shift to the micro level. The second one is this idea of civilian agency. And the third one, which I think is really, really important, is the, uh, it has to do with what we call wartime institutions. And I think this has really made a big difference. It has provoked, has shifted and advanced a lot of research on conflict, which has exploded in the last 10 years or so. Uh, for a long time, and we've heard Omar already sort of uh, alluding to some of these uh, big debates, for a long time, the research, research on conflict, particularly in development economics, of which there was not much, <laughs> focus very much on the issues around security and capacity of states. It was about states, um, which really had a lot of importance because it brought attention to development and to development economics in particular to the importance of uh, conflict and violence in the, across the world. About 15 years ago, and it's probably still the truth uh, right now, no development economics textbook referred to conflict at all. This, the, this has shifted quite dramatically, and it did, for policy reasons. Uh, the Millennium Development Goals highlighted the fact that the only countries that would not achieve the Millennium Development Gro Goals had in common the fact that they all were conflict-affected countries. And there's been this explosion of work. And uh, for a long time, the work did uh, focus on the states, but then it started becoming obvious that subnational uh, patterns and trends and processes were really important. And while the first, call it conflict 101, uh, was really important in kind of understanding the triggers of conflict and what drives civil wars mostly, we sort of forgot what happens at subnational level. And this has changed quite dramatically recently, and most of the new advances have been at the micro level. And uh, some of it uh, has actually been co convened by the Houses in Conflict Network, which I convened together with Tillman Brook and Philip Verwimp, and was born here at WIDA 11 years ago, uh, when Tony Addison brought us together in a panel that gave rise to the Houses in Conflict Network. So it's great to be here 11 years later to, to tell you about what's been happening in the field since then. And what's been happening is quite remarkable in the short space of time. Uh, one of the big contributions has been a lot of evidence, a lot of data collection has been happening, a lot of uh, difficult work done under very difficult circumstances. We were told there is no way you can collect data, empirical evidence in war-torn countries, DRC, Afghanistan, and so forth. It is possible, we've shown it's possible, and we have quite a wealth of data uh, and, and the network now extends, quite a few members I see are present here today. Um, the other um, advance that this micro-focus has, has brought to, to, to the field is this idea that people matter, and actually people's behavior and the way uh, in different interactions and social interactions happen in the field really matter to explain why conflict lasts, why conflict reignites, why, what different processes of conflict take place. And this has been also uh, uh, highlighted in, 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 uh, in policy, uh, in, in the policy world where there's definitely a lot of much more sort of people um, centered approaches have become much more prominent than in the past. Uh, one of the great the examples being the, the World Bank community led development programs which spend now currently uh, billions of dollars focusing on, on getting uh, the sort of relations in the, on, on the ground right. And one of the big developments has been sort of a move from this idea that people, people that live in conflict areas, these are the people we're talking about here when we talk about policy, how to make their lives better. And it turns out that um, people that live in conflict areas are not, they suffer a lot of conflict, there are lots of victimization and so forth, and et cetera. But, we, but there's been a kind of slight shift from sort of focusing people as victims 
and trying to understand people as agents in the conflict itself. And this has been quite, quite significant. And it has led to new developments even within development economics itself. And we now understand that actually these dynamics, these local dynamics really matter to understand why where fighting takes place, for whom, for how long, and so forth. Um, and the other big event, the sort of big body of research that has taken place recently over the sort of five years or so, is a very simple idea. It turns out that what happens during conflict matters to explain post-conflict. And it's quite simple, but somehow it gets forgotten. And there's this idea that conflicts are areas of anarchy, blank slates, where you know, once the conflict is over, we can come in and try to solve the situation, which, of course, is not the case. Uh, at a theoretical level, this, this kind of idea that you can do policy in conflict areas once a conflict is ended and you can sort of implement some of the development as, uh, as, uh, develop as business as usual, like Graciela was mentioning, um, is it, theoretically we tend to think uh, of conflict areas as uh, areas where social order has broken down. So we have large literatures on stale, stale collapse, the state failure literature, and so forth. However, if you've been to any of the, these areas where fighting takes place, what we see is that although state institutions may collapse, it's not necessarily the case that order collapses. And this is what makes conflict areas so difficult to understand and to intervene in. And what happens is that spaces are, em are empty and they're left for uh, uh, different actors, political actors, to come, to come in and occupy that space. Um, if you remember, you know, mm -hmm. violence has been with us since the beginning of human history. Violence happens for a reason, and it happens because violence is a means through which institutions are born and raised and created and destroyed. So if you start thinking in this way, it's not that surprising to see that lots happen in conflict areas. And we know these groups. We know some of these groups. And um, we have the FARC in Colombia, Hamas, Hezbollah, Taliban, a lot of ISIS now. These groups are occupying empty spaces, and they are providing order, which make, makes it really difficult to sort of break. This is, relations get established in, the, in, the, in different areas, and they are very difficult to break. There's, no, there's not surprising that the presence of these successful groups, many of them fail in the process of getting there, have to, are present in conflicts of long duration as well. So, there's something to understand there. And there's been lots of work done around these issues, as people have called rebel governance, uh, where there's a body of research uh, on, on trying to understand how these relationships with, between combatants and non-combatants happen between our groups and civilians, with a lot of implications for policy like policy like combatants in the reintegration and so forth. Lots of work also around understanding changing of social norms during conflict, which has huge implications for how we do development at community level. And so where do we go from here? Uh, again, this is my personal choice. I'm sure a lot more should be, could be added here. I could, I could spend the next two hours going over various uh, exciting areas of research. Um, but I, I've picked three, and the three I've picked are about linking these two different views of the world. It's about data and uh, the fact, trying to make a point that violence happens outside Africa and it happens outside civil wars, and this is kind of sort of new movement and new, new understandings that are happening in the field. So we've started on st from states, we've, we worked a lot on understanding states and state capacity. We've spent the last 10 years on micro. How can we bring this together? Uh, if these new developments in micro level analysis are to be successful, but they can only be successful to the extent they'll explain, they'll provide the micro foundations to understand the bigger phenomenon. Uh, so can we, can we actually use all this learning from, from field, field work and micro level to understand big questions such as why conflict persists and mutates, um, survival and security, negotiation process and so forth. We're not there, but we're getting there. Uh, and new work is, is happening quite, uh, quite significant. And I, I can see a lot of it is going to happen in, in the next five years. There's lots of work on, on so-called by Statis Calivas and Laibal Cells on technologies of rebellion. How do uh, fighting strategies 
at the subnational level actually have implications for both what happens to people and what happens to states. The research agenda on wartime institutions is quite significant uh, to have spoken about that. Collective action, where does civil society come from? We, we have three actors in conflicts. We have the state, we have the civil society, and we have the armed actors. We, we sort of focus quite a lot on state civilian relationships. We don't focus so much on a sort of armed groups, civilian relationships, and the rise of civil society and how that gets affected by the conflict. Quite a lot of research being done at that level. Systems of patronage, how do this institutional change that happened in conflict, driven by relationships between armed groups and civilians mostly, and by armed groups I mean most rebel groups, but also military. Um, how does that then reflect in post-conflict politics? And, and it has huge reflections. And, and, and there's also a, a very interesting area of research around business and, and war economies at the local level, which is quite interesting as well. And all this research is kind of uh, amalgamated to this, to trying to, to try to link these two views on the world. So conflicts are not just about the states and the people. There's something in between that will have to link states with the people. And that's what, what new, the new research that is coming up is trying to do. Then I have to talk about data. Uh, I do a lot of data collection. And, and we've done a lot, and we have a lot of data on populations living in conflict, on, on sort of political events, on conflict and violence events. There's a lot out there that can be used. But we still are at the case study level. Very little comparative work has been done. And this requires huge investments. To do this kind of work at comparative level requires huge investments that only sort of the big international organizations can do. And uh, Tillman and I uh, and, and Philip Vervin as well, we're working together with the World Bank to try to push this agenda a bit, uh, um, a bit forward and see what comes out of that. And finally, We've spent a lot of time, most of, of new research on conflict is about a restricted number of failed states in Africa where civil wars have taken place. And that's, it, it was obvious this, the, the analysis were gonna start there. But um, one thing that is quite clear is that although you learn a lot about why conflict happens and why it lasts and so forth from these case studies, we sort of miss out the transition period and if we think about history, think about the history of Europe, for instance, where wars have taken place and institutions have changed so over hundreds of years, not the 10 and 20 years that we're trying to do sort of policy in conflict affected countries. Well, we need to learn from both uh, how these transitions happen. How do you move from a state of conflict to a state of peace? And this is extremely complex and you don't learn that just focusing on countries that tend to go back into conflict constantly. You also learn those from those that succeeded, including Europe itself, the US, the civil war in the US. So you learn a lot from these long transition periods. And we should kind of try to do more about that. Um, also, we know now that most violence takes place in non-fragile countries. Uh, so a lot is happening outside the traditional field states in Africa. Uh, there's a rise importance. Urban violence is, is another area which has been untapped, but obviously has implications for how we understand the world today. And protests, social tensions, and so forth. There is a lot to be learned from recent research on conflict, in civil, civil war conflict, to understand the sort of rise of, of protests and when protests become violent and so forth. So I think there's a lot of research that's going to emerge there. But I'll, I'll stop here. Thank you very much.